Well, Chris, first off, let me just start off by asking you, this is probably the easiest question you'll get. What qualified you to take on this role and uh, what would your highest priority be? Well, um, I'm not sure that anything can really qualify a person to, you know, run for a civic office. I know there's basic qualifications like being a certain age for like mayor and, you know, there's not any other qualifications, you know, pertaining to education or anything like that. But uh, I think one has to be civically minded, uh, want to be uh, doing what's right for everybody and also uh, doing the due process of the position, knowing what the mayor can and cannot do as well, uh, knowing the city charter and, and, uh, and so forth. And, and so, you know, those, those things I think is what can qualify a person to run for office. And I think we need more people to actually run for these offices. I mean, you see the mayor's race, we've got a lot of people running this time, but in the past we've always, had races where there's little to no involvement. So I think that that's a, a really good, uh, you know, thing to focus on right there as well. Sure. Well, let's move into the budget, which is a pretty big deal. Uh, the city is estimated to lose $8 million in revenue due to the COVID-19 pandemic in the 2021 fiscal year. As mayor, how would you balance a difficult budget in the fiscal year 2022 or after under the stress caused by COVID? Well, for first, uh, you know, we need to have budgets or audits that actually reflect the budgets. Uh, you know, we need to look at uh, where we're losing the funding at or our money at, um, where funding can be reallocated to uh, help the booster the economy as well. Um, I think we need to look at maybe looking outside the box at building up our economy, looking at uh, a gift economy is what they call, call uh, there's an aspect called a gift economy. Uh, there's also other eco economic uh, things that we can look into to spur like micro grants, uh, programs and, and things like that. I think the state has programs where, you know, the city can apply for the grants and basically they're, they're passed through to pass the money off to uh, other organizations or agencies. And, uh, you know, we need to, as a city, we need to look at uh, recouping from this COVID-19 pandemic as well. Um, you know, a lot of the money we receive is from the tourist industry. So maybe we have to look at uh, seeing ways of, you know, making up that loss here on a local level, maybe investing more into our local economy, investing in local people, starting up more local businesses uh, and, you know, and spurring that entrepreneurship that I think could fill the void of our economy as well. Um, okay, well, as we near a year since the virus hit Chattanooga, businesses and individuals within the city are struggling due to COVID-19 as well. How would you provide aid to those businesses, the ones that you just spoke of, and families hit hardest by the pandemic's economic impact? Are there programs in place you want to keep, and what other programs would you add? Well, I know, you know, there, there's programs that the city has in place. I think they do have, you know, they have micro grant programs, and they have a uh, a program set up to help people who uh, have been evicted and so forth. And I think the city needs to look at redeveloping or revamping some of these programs. Uh, we, a lot of times uh, there's issues with people knowing even about, about the programs. And then there's a lack of funding attached to uh, some of these programs that we do have. Uh, so we need to look at uh, maybe say if you're a homeowner and you're looking towards losing your house because of, of COVID, maybe having a freeze on the property taxes or, uh, you know, halving the property taxes. So that you're still, the city still bringing in a little bit of income, but trying to work with families um, to, to alleviate that issue. I think a lot of times too, the city tries to drive people to organizations that deal with, you know, certain issues and relating to those aspects. 
And when they do, though, a lot of times these organizations tend to take advantage of these, these people as well. And so we need to, to curve that issue too, because there's a lot of discrimination that goes on pertaining to these issues. Uh, so we need to look at, you know, curving the discrimination issue, curving organizations having their hands so deeply into the, these issues and looking for the city to, to find ways to alleviate them, whether it's through the Chattanooga Housing Authority or through the Economic Community Development Center. Well, paving hey, and I'm I was sorry. Gonna, oh no, you're okay. fine. I was going to say too. I know. I know that uh, you know the mask mandate issue that has put a big strain on a lot of businesses here locally as well. And you know, uh, the city the city should follow what OSHA has put out because OSHA has put out guidelines, uh, safety guidelines pertaining to what the CDC has put out on how to conduct business during this this time and so you know i think that uh the city could be a good steward by following what osha has put out for those standards and you know just uh making sure that businesses you know encouraging them to do the same thing but not doing stuff that's going to hinder businesses from being able to operate i know we see a couple of local businesses right now uh, talking about shutting down, and that's concerning to me as well. Excellent. Paving and transportation consistently rank at the top of the citizens' top concerns here, according to annual studies by the city. What transportation or infrastructural goals would you have if elected? Well, the, the first goal of mine would be to make sure the city is enforcing and complying by the EPA consent decree that we're locked under that deals with our sewage transportation. Um, we have a sewage system that is becoming dilapidated and um, we've had money put aside to fix these problems and we've received money from the state revolving funds to fix these problems, but we hardly see any work come out of it. A lot of the work that we do see is, is relining and you know, a lot of times that relining process isn't fixing the problem uh, correctly. And so we still have roads that tend to sink in in the center and all they do is want to patch up or put patch patches or cover up work. And so what I think the city needs to do, and I know they've, they, the uh, Andy Burke tried to do this by creating CDOT, is creating a department through the public works that mainly focuses on just strictly paving all year round and bringing up not only our roads back up to federal regulations and guidelines because there's there's uh, federal guidelines and regulations put out for like say truck uh, road size for truck trucking and so forth and just car road size I think it's uh, 12 feet per lane and so we need to look make sure that we're maintaining these guidelines as well to make sure that we're we're falling into being a municipality. Uh, so with the paving and that, I would look at maybe reorganizing CDOT because you know it's a good concept, but it's it's obviously not working right. Um, I know a lot of the potholes that get filled is is put through 311 and that gets carried out by public works department. So we need to look at uh, having our departments work work closer together as well and start uh, not just doing cover up work, but looking into the future of, of actually replacing pipes and replacing roads, quit building the roads up and making our, our problems more compiled because I believe that's, that's some of the issues that we have is that we've had these issues compiled for, you know, 40 years or, or longer. And now we're here we're left to, to clean up the issues and you know the funding has been spent to fix these issues but we don't we don't have nothing to do so so we have to look at new measures to put in place to tackle these problems we're going to move into some business and economy questions 
City labor unions and many activists support a $15 minimum wage for city employees, which Mayor Burke had intended to begin implementing prior to COVID. Do you support this or any other specific pay increase plans for city employees? Why or why not? Well, I think the city needs to have a competitive uh, pay program. You know, we need to be competitive with other cities. Uh, you know, we have some of the lowest paid public works departments and uh, fire department and uh, police department workers. Uh, I know average pay for, I think police department starts off at um, maybe top $20,000, like 27 or $26,000. And I think public works starts off a little, you know, at like maybe some, some positions start off, I think at 1450. And these are positions that you would or I would look at and say, man, these people deserve a lot more. Um, and I think they do. Uh, that, that, and that's the problem is uh, the city needs to look at ways to uh, cut the fraud, waste and abuse out so we can find those funds to give to the workers. You know, I, I think that people wor working a weed, e weed eater, for example, should be making at least $20, $20 an hour not if more, even the garbage men, they should be making uh, $27 at least, at least, not if more. I mean, we have gar guys riding on the back of the trucks, which they would call a slingers position, and they're just making just basic, you know, and it's sad. <clears throat> also to deal with that too, though, is, is you know, we have a lot of uh, talk about pensions and people are worried about losing the pensions, but they have to understand that if if a government is ran well, and you know the, a lot of people here see our government as a business, but it's supposed to be a service. And if it was ran correctly and ran well, about all that the city would have to put into a pension to match is about three to four percent uh, cost. So they, the cost could be real low. And I think pensions is is a government pensions is the way to to go, not turn them into a four hundred one k plan as well. And I think that the, that we should we should be hiring more public work workers instead of outsourcing uh, or contracting out a lot of the work, um, because you know, uh, with with hiring public works, you can actually see where your tax dollars are going. And I think that we need to look at reevaluating how three one one services ran. So if people do have driver complaints, those can be taken right away and dealt with like right there on the spot. Okay. In 2019, 40% of Chattanooga's households are housing cost burdened, meaning they pay more than 30% of their income for housing and may struggle to afford other necessities. How would you address affordable housing as mayor? Well, uh, the first thing I would do is look at um, reorganizing or restructuring the Chattanooga Housing Authority because it seems like they're price setting the housing market because that's where that 30% of your income comes from is from the housing authority where they believe that uh, affordable housing should be made up of 30% of one's income. So even if uh, say you're living in one of the housing projects or their, their apartments that they own and you get a new job and your pay increases, then also your rent increases. So it makes it hard for you to move out of those areas. So we need to look at uh, reevaluating what percentage we see as affordable housing and stop price setting the market and have a, a, a more free economy. Um, I know when I was a kid, you know, one could rent a house for about 450 to $650. And now that same house has either doubled or almost tripled in, in cost, you know? And so we have to reevaluate um, that because, you know, the, the, the price of, of, or cost of living has gone up, but people's income has not. Well, a number of Chattanoogans are experiencing homelessness. How would you further the city's progress toward reducing homelessness as mayor? Well, 
I know the city has uh, now to date conducted two studies to actually alleviate the homeless issue. Um, I've read over these studies. I think one was done back in 2009 and the other one was just done recently. Um, and, you know, I, I think that these studies, they had good concepts and ideas. And if the city would stick to some of these ideas that we that are put out in these studies, that we could alleviate these issues a little bit better. Um, I know that uh, I see one of the issues that I see in it is it seems like the homeless issue here has been turned into a money making machine or a way for organizations to gain funding from either the city or the federal level or the state level. And I think that needs to be reevaluated. Um, I think that if if an um, organization isn't working um, like a weld oil machine and providing the services that it's supposed to provide um, that we're paying for, then we might need to uh, reevaluate giving that funding out um, because then that funding could be reallocated elsewhere where it's needed. Um, I know the housing authority as well sits on housing stock because they have um, units that I would say is uninhabitable because they need to be upgraded and either they don't have the money to upgrade or they've had the money to upgrade but never did the upgrades. A lot of these units sit out there at Wheeler Homes uh, and, and other areas. And so we need to, like I said, we need to look at reorganizing the Chattanooga Housing Authority to help because I, th I think they could help vet homeless people or, or nomadic people um, into housing if they choose to do so. I also think that we need to look at um, developing urban campgrounds um, and also, you know, looking at other organizations that want to offer maybe a, a tiny house community uh, with that that is supported by the the city through community uh, grant funding and and also um, community trust. That way, it's you know it can be set up for for forever or look look to be set up for the future. So I think we need to look into things like that to address these these issues. And also once we do studies, stick to what, what those findings are in those studies and stop giving uh, money out to organizations that aren't really uh, helping to alleviate the problem. Okay, and you talked about businesses. Well, downtown Chattanooga wants a showcase is struggling to hold on to businesses. How can that be improved? What factors have made downtown less appealing to businesses? And could the business improvement district be at play? Um, I think the business improvement district could be at play because it, it imposed another tax on top of businesses that were already struggling um, because uh, businesses downtown pay uh, a few different taxes already so that they, they what they did was put another tax for services that should have already been provided by the public works department to hire out an outsourced company through the, the bid district. Um, also, I kn I've talked to a lot of businesses downtown and over and over again, you hear that there's parking issues, you know, and you know, I'd like to see in the future the city actually have uh, free parking spots or offer uh, free parking a little bit more uh, because I, I see that we have paid for these spots downtown that are metered over and over again. We've paid for their upkeep. We've paid for the meters to be put there. We've paid for the road itself through our taxes, our, our, our past generation has and our great grandparents have as well. And so we need to start looking at, uh, you know, having more free parking and more accessible parking downtown to help these businesses strive as well. Um, also look at maybe offering, I know Carta owns a, um, a parking garage and they want more people to ride the buses. So maybe offer uh, free parking to people who go to businesses downtown 
and, and not charge them. So that way it promotes people not only riding our public transportation system, but also promotes, uh, you know, the businesses downtown as well there and offering more stock, you know, having uh, a way to, if you want to stop at that certain business, you know, you can, you can have the bus stop right there instead of the bus stopping at each designated stop as well. So we need to look at, you know, a, a few different aspects there on, on helping the businesses downtown. But I think a lot of it has to deal with, with parking. You know, a lot of people don't want to hear local, don't want to go downtown and pay for, for parking when they can go out to the mall, you know, and have sort of the same type of restaurant and not have to pay for any type of parking. And, and the, you know, the sad thing is we hear, we hear downtown, it's, oh, it's a panhandling issue. A lot of people don't want to go down there be, because of that. But that's not really as bad as, as it's perceived to be. I think it's made out to be a bigger issue than what it really is. Sure. Well, speaking of that, let's move into some questions about public safety. So Chattanooga saw a sharp increase in gun violence in 2020. How would you as mayor work to lower violent crime rates in Chattanooga? Well, first off, I would look at getting out of the violence reduction initiative and setting something up here ourselves to address the issues. Um, the VRI program to me is a failed program that, that just uh, we pay for consulting. You know, we can get that consulting here local, I think, on the local level by just asking more of a public input into the matter. Um, you know, we have a lot of issues with state laws as well with the gun violence because the state laws pertaining to the buyback program is is flawed. I think that any guns confiscated by the police department should go and be destroyed, not be uh, turned around for resale. Um, also, you know, we've had a lot of issues with our department itself following uh, its own policy and setting the good example for the community as well. So I think we need to look at having our, our department first set the good example for the community and then looking at pulling out of the VRI program, adopting a, a local a group here to come up with a, a better set plan, um, reinvesting or investing more into the rec centers, turning them into more like a, a YMCA type center and also, so that way there's more programs out there for uh, kids and teenagers to do, keep them busy if they, if they choose so. Also for adults as well, you know? And so I think, I think that alleviating the crime and dealing with that is a, is a multi uh, facet approach there where you'd have to come at it on different uh, levels and the majority of it is is getting rid of the the wasteful spending that we have with the VRI program, making sure our police department follows the policy, and looking at at getting local consulting from people in the community to deal with these issues. Um, you know, to me, to you know, when your streets are dark at night and you have dark areas, it it makes it more acceptable for crime as well. Um, so I would look at you know, um, having a solar uh, light initiative through EPB to, you know, have more lights put up on streets as well. And more, so we don't have all these dark areas to try to, you know, have the communities feel safer too. We need to look at making people feel safer in the communities and people wanting to stay there and invest. It seems like a lot of times, we see uh, a lot of crime pop up in communities that are poised for redevelopment. It seems like a little bit of what I consider panic peddling is going on there. All right. Well, activists spent this summer protesting police brutality across the country and in Chattanooga demanding defunding or divesting from the police. Would you consider defunding or divesting from CPD for reform? Or in what other ways, if any, would you consider law enforcement reform? Well, um, like I said uh, just a second ago, you know, the police department needs to adhere to their policy 
Well, and also they need to look at uh, revamping some of that policy. I believe they pay for their policy book from a, an organization um, who, who is used nationally. Um, but when you look at their policy book, which I believe is 814 pages long, um, the de-escalation section is pretty vague. Um, but the use for um, weapons or, or how to subdue somebody is, is pretty long. So I think we need to look at reevaluating that. Um, I'd like to, you know, divest from the police department. And when I say that, I don't mean dif defund, but I mean um, reallocate some of their funding into rec centers and have community uh, police precincts where uh, if you or me as a community member wanted to get involved as, as say policing our community or neighborhood watch, we could work with that community precinct to do so. Um, also, I think it would alleviate a lot of uh, gas costs that the department has and also um, give a spot for the police officers to hang out instead of just hanging out in, in public parking lots um, to, as well. <clears throat> and I think it would also help strengthen the communities and give money into, you know, be able to put more funding into the rec centers. Um, the only way this would be carried out, though, is after restructuring the Parks and Recreation Department um, into a commission style, so that way they can be more accountable for their funding and open to the public as well. That is, you know, because I would not want to give the, that department any more funding um, without them being more accountable. Yeah. And many activists and some candidates have called for the removal of current high ranking officers and that includes Chief Friday. What have any changes in CPD leadership would you implement if elected mayor? You talked about the policy, what about leadership? Well, I know a lot of their leadership uh, has been on the force for a long time. Um, you know, with Chief Rodney, I believe that when they appointed him, when the when Mayor Burke chose him for police chief, that it actually violated the city charter because the city charter states that we're supposed to have a police chief from the city limits. Um, so that concerns me because, you know, uh, he, he lives on Signal Mountain and, and in, in my mind and in a lot of other people's, you know, Signal Mountain has its own problems to deal with uh, daily and, and the people who live up there um, sort of have their own problems and, and you know, like they have their, they try to, they've been trying to separate their school system from ours and so forth and, and be more separate than this, you know, from the city in, in, in Hamilton County. And so that concerned me when, when Mayor Burke appointed him. Um, there's also some uh, high ranking officers that uh, you know, could, I, I would say maybe operate in the gray area and that needs to be questioned. A lot of them too, uh, because they've been so um, com comfortable in their position, um, they violate policy all the time. And so I think these need, this needs to be reevaluated and maybe, you know, have them even go through the rehiring process again. Uh, if they want to stay on the department, but I think the department needs to really go through some house cleaning as well. I think the whole city, uh, all the departments in the city needs to go through through a house cleaning. We have a lot of issues with policy not being followed, a lot of fraud, waste, and abuse of our tax dollars. Um, I found out recently that the, the city uh, has the Chattanooga Police Department leasing cars from the city. Um, but I cannot get any more information into that yet. But so the, these issues concern me because we have, you know, we have a lot of misspending that could be fixed with with this, you know, with rehiring or getting rid of some of the higher ups that we have. You know, I mean, if why why try to keep what has not worked? You know, and, and I know that legally you can't just go through and fire people and so forth. But I think that it's time to 
uh, go through a reevaluation of, of our, our department. Okay. Maybe even, even reassess, you know, go through a reassessment process and see if these people are even conducting their job correctly. And if not, you know, then like say, for example, if they're not following their policy, then you have grounds to, you know, dismiss that person or let them go. Right, well, many instances and confrontations with the police, the areas, surveillance of activists on private property, and the nature of some arrests. If similar unrest came up during your term as mayor, how would you weigh restrictions for activists and police presence? What have you have done differently? Well, for one, uh, with the protest, you know, the mayor, if he, you know, people have the right to protest. And if he, if he was really concerned about the, people getting out of hand, he could have said, well, here's the designated area for you to protest in. Uh, and we ask you to respect the city. Uh, you know, he didn't do that. Uh, we have a, had a lot of issues uh, with uh, what I would say police brutality, um, you know, with people being ripped out of their cars. We had a, a young girl ripped out of the car in front of the jail as well. Um, and as mayor, I would have addressed those issues head on by saying, you know, by telling the truth which was policy was not followed in a lot of these issues. Um, when policy is not followed, that's very concerning. And when you, you as a mayor allow policy to be breached, that's even more concerning because it's, it shows where your, where your concern is. It's not with public safety or the public, it's, it's with private interest. Um, I know that the police are trying to take a new technology approach. Um, I think that's one of the reasons why they brought former uh, Chief Police Fred Fletcher in from Austin was because Austin has that type of technology set up for their police department where they use more cameras to police. And I think that's what Chattanooga is now trying to adopt. But they have to take into consideration that you can't use those cameras as, a, as just to spy on people. You know, it's more of a of a, a deterrence, and if a crime happens, say on that street, then you can see uh, the car or the person involved in that crime. But it should never be used to strictly just spy on somebody's house. That's an invasion of of people's civil liberties and and rights. And anybody who that who has that going on, I would implore them to contact the FBI about that issue and report the city. Have you received the COVID-19 vaccine? And if not, will you when it's available? Um, no, I have not. And I probably uh, won't uh, receive it. Um, and that's just because, you know, I'm a younger person. I don't think mm -hmm. that I, I, I think that vaccine, because there's only a certain amount should go to somebody else, you know, who, who needs it. I know there's a lot of elderly people who uh, believe that the that it will make them, you know, safe from the from the virus, and so I think that it, you know it could be better used somewhere else, and that's the reason why I would I would not take it. All right, just a few more here for you. Do you believe transparency to be important in the mayor's office, and if so, how will you ensure that continues through your term? Will you grant interviews with reporters like myself and answer our questions on a regular basis? Well, yes, I think transparency is one of the key factors for having a, an efficient government. And uh, right now, it, we, you know, we have a lack of, of transparency and we have a censorship that goes on as well. I mean, if you look at the city council meetings, the speaking rules there, you can only speak twice in 30 days. And then there's a lot of um, other rules that pertain to what you can say, can and cannot say. And that should never be in place. I think that the mayor should also attend the city council meetings as well and sit up there with the council and hear what the public has to say. 
Um, I, I know for a fact that me, myself, I've been blocked from our current administration's office. Um, I've tried to meet with them several times about issues um, that are in our neighborhood and, and in our city. And, and, to, and not just to, you know, sit there and, and down them or anything. I wanted to actually sit there and have a discussion with him on how he could alleviate some of these problems. And he just denied me. So I think that should never happen. There, we need to have an open and transparent government that works for everybody. And I think that it needs to look this, you know, the city needs to look at revamping its uh, website to allow that to happen. You know, we need to have a, an area where we can put in real time comments and get real time feedback. Excellent. Well, what, you kind of talked about this a little bit, but uh, if you want to just uh, rehash it, what should the relationship between the mayor and city council look like? Will you cultivate relationships with council members? Well, I think the, the city mayor uh, should sit on the council with the council members uh, at the meetings. I think he should be involved in the meetings as well and, and start abiding by Robert's rules of order on how we're conducting our, our public meetings. Um, it concerns me that he's not because it shows that um, either he knows that the city isn't truly a municipality because the city has fallen out of compliance with federal uh, guidelines, state guidelines, the EPA consent decree, and even our city's charter. And so maybe he doesn't want to participate because he sees it as a fraud. And so I want to fix all that. I want to get rid of all those frauds and have a, a government that actually is a municipality again, one that doesn't see itself as a business, but it actually as a service as what it's supposed to be. Yeah, this is a fun one. Would you support public money for a new Chattanooga Lookout Stadium? I would say right off, off the top right now, looking at our project projections, no. I know they want to have uh, the stadium uh, taxpayer subsidized. And, you know, the problem with that is we've had projects in the past that have been taxpayer subsidized and the taxpayers as a whole, as, this, as all city residents, we don't see a return of that investment. Only maybe a certain group sees a return on that investment. You know, and it almost seems like a lot of times, a lot of our leaders only see the downtown area as Chattanooga. They forget that Chattanooga spans all the way to Middle Valley. You know, we have Lookout Valley, we have the Ridge, we have other areas that's the city that get neglected and forgotten about. And, and I believe that, you know, instead of paying for a stadium that they may maybe can turn to the state to get help, but the city should focus on, on its residents and getting our neighborhoods back up to order before we invest in anything that large. All right, and lastly, Chris, is there anything else you'd like your voters to know about you, Christopher Dahl, anything else? Mm, well, they can, they can call me anytime at my phone number is 423-693-4731. Um, I've put together a website at electchrisdahl.com. And, you know, whether I win or not, I just want people to know that I'll continue to, to speak out and be the voice of, of the people. Um, I've done it for, I'd say, a few years now, maybe a little bit longer. Uh, pointing out fraud, waste, and abuse of our tax dollars, speaking out about policy issues that are vague or should not be in place, um, just challenging um, what our local government has done in the past, um, not just our city, but also our county. And, and I'll continue to do so whether I win or not, because we need somebody to speak out because a lot of times, um, a lot of these projects are now being paid for with municipal bonds. So it's being charged to our future generation. And so somebody needs to be the voice for our future so that that way they don't have all these issues that we're having right now. And that they can see some, like my son and other people's children can see these issues 
being alleviated. And then that way we have money to focus on the needs, true needs of our community and more money to invest in our community as well. Um, I'd like to see a budgeting process that's inclusive, that uh, has all communities involved where 30 to 40 percent of all taxes collected get to stay in that neighborhood and then that neighborhood can actually decide how those taxes are allocated. Um, and I understand, how, you know, the duties or the, the uh, yeah, the duties of the mayor or how, how far the mayor can go. And a lot of times we get a lot of people running for office who tell us a lot of, a lot of things the mayor can't do or promise a lot of things that politicians can't get done. And I'm not one of those people. I'm just a person who, you know, out here grub hubbing every day to make his living and seeing how it really is in the city and talking to people on a daily basis and just really concerned about what goes on. So that's why I decided to run for office. Christopher, thank you so much for talking to us today and giving us an opportunity to, to, to put a, a scope to why you're running here and let our viewers know that. And we appreciate your time. Appreciate and thanks for the opportunity as well. All right.